I hope everybody had a really nice lunch and enjoyed the fishes. Did you see the giant turtle in the, the big tent? That was awesome, right? Yeah. So anyway, um, imagine that you spend your days looking at the stars and seeing all of these fascinating shapes. Well, I actually started my career, like Irene said, uh, working with the infinity of space and handling the enormous amount of data that it can produce. And although I graduated as an astronomer, I switched to a career as a data scientist. But I guess I couldn't say goodbye to the visually focused astronomer inside of me because I found myself loving the visualization of the data uh, even more than the analysis itself. So I switched gears again and am now a down-to-earth data visualization designer for Agen during the day. While at night I um, work on personal projects or experiment with new ideas or create tutorials for my website. And I found that in data visualization, I tend to be a perfectionist. I love spending hours and hours on some pretty small detail to make it exactly as I have in mind. While well, being born and raised in Holland, I always willfully hope that maybe my craving for perfectionism stems from the same genes as those of the Dutch master painters. <laughs> you never know, you never know. It's a small country. Um, <laughs> uh, but you know, they, they managed to put such a dedication to detail into their artworks. And although data visualization and, and uh, painting isn't exactly the same thing, I do always start my visuals on plain paper. And once I have a mental image of how something should look, the computer had damn well be able to create some semblance of it on the screen for me. <laughs> However, usually what I have in mind isn't quite the default setting or what all of the examples are using. And that forces me to try and think outside of the box from time to time. But you'd be surprised by the results if you try to experiment with the norm, use things in an unconventional manner, or get inspiration from different fields of design to create a more effective or fun visualization. Okay, we're almost ready to go and take off beyond the shapes, but just to be sure, let me quickly explain how SVGs, scalable vector graphics, fit into the world of D3. Well, when you start working with D3, you figure out that its building blocks, its shapes, are SVGs. And by combining these circles and rectangles and lines and paths, you can create some awesome visualizations. I'd like to take you along on my journey on how I started using SVGs beyond their mere shapes. Well, my first step beyond shapes came when I was trying to create a color legend. And I just wanted a legend that would go smoothly through all of the colors that I was using. And that's how I got into SVG gradients. And the reason was that <coughs> the data set that I was working with, for that it wasn't really necessary to read off the exact value that each color represented. It was more about seeing trends and getting an overall sense of the numbers, such as a heat map, for example. Here we have the total number of uh, traffic accidents that occurred in the Netherlands in 2014, aggregated on a day of the week on the vertical <laughs> and hour of the day on the horizontal. And the darker the color, the more uh, accidents that occurred in that combination of day and hour. So no surprise here that most accidents occur during the morning and especially the evening rush hours. Uh, but it's really about seeing trends. It isn't that important that you um, know that one thing is either 1,420 or 1,440 accidents. It's about seeing more of the trends. And it's this legend below. That's what I mean with having a, a smooth legend going through all of your colors. And it's nothing more than a uh, rectangle, SVG rectangle, filled with a gradient. And because I'm going to show you a few more gradient examples after this, let me first quickly explain how you can create one using D3. Well, there's actually something called a linear gradient element. But you have to append this or nest it within a depth element. And depth is short for definitions, and it holds the special things, such as, well, gradients, but also filters, which we'll see later. And it's also very important that you give your gradient a unique ID so that you can reference it again later on when you set the fill of the element that you want to apply the gradient to. Well, after that, we have to give it information about the direction along which the gradient should run across your shape. And you do this in a way that's very similar to making an SVG line. So we have a starting point with x1, y1, and then we give it an end point with x2, y2. Um, and we can supply these values in both percentages and um, exact pixel locations. But in 90% of the cases, percentages is just way easier. 
So a horizontal gradient has x1 at 0%, x2 at 100%, and both y's can be the same, 0% is fine. And by playing around with these values, you can create a vertical gradient or a gradient along any angle that you might want. Although here, and this is actually not the tr truth that I'm showing here, because it's actually the bounding box, so the smallest rectangle that can enclose the entire shape that defines sort of these, where these endpoints lie. So in this case, the starting point of 0, 0 percent is actually outside of what is visible in the shape. And that means that once you start seeing it, it's already turned slightly more purple. And maybe you don't want that. You know, that's fine. You don't have to start at 0 percent. You can start wherever you want, and then all the colors outside of it will just be padded with whatever was there at the end of your gradient. But we're just going to use a normal horizontal gradient. So now that we've set the direction, all that's left to do is supply it with some color information. And for that, we have the stop elements. And with a stop element, you supply it with a color, the stop color, and the offset, which is the location along that sort of directional arrow that that color should be pure. Well, here I've appended a light blue color all the way at the start at 0%. And then I'm going to append another color stop, otherwise it wouldn't be a gradient, at the other end at 100% of a dark blue color. Now the gradient is done, it can be used. So we select that, re um, that rectangle, and then we set its fill style by referencing that unique ID that we created for the gradient. And then we get this result. Well, if you have many colors in your gradient, it might become tedious to keep on appending these color stops. But luckily, we can use D3's nifty data step to um, append color stops for us in a, in a way that's very similar to um, appending circles to a scatter plot. So let's go back to when we just set the direction of the horizontal gradient, and this time we're going to append a data set that holds the offset location and the color that it should have at that location. And then D3 will append a stop for each of these data points. Afterwards, it only takes two more lines to set this uh, offset and stop color by referencing the data. And now we have a smooth um, gradient going all through all these, these nine colors that was uh, sort of shorter to write. Well, another example that is in essence a heat map is um, what you see here and can therefore, I think, be combined with a legend with a smooth color range. It's actually a visual output of a machine learning technique to cluster data called self-organizing maps. And it's what started my love for hexagons. And I wish I could say I was using the palette that you could see right now, the color palette, but I was actually working with these right before I knew that data visualization was a thing in itself. I didn't know that for a long time. Um, and I am from the science background, so the actual palette that I used was uh. a rainbow. <laughs> Yay. Yes, so. Anyway, if anybody's interested in knowing how to interpret these, uh, these kind of maps, you can ask me uh, later today or tomorrow. But to stay in the rainbow mood, here's my, one of my favorite temperature visualizations, and I re recreated a weather radial for Boston for weather of last year. And each day is a bar, and it goes from the minimum temperature to the maximum temperature, and then it's colored according to the average temperature. And I would say here again, it's mostly about seeing trends. So when was it very hot, or when was it cold? Well, being an astronomer, I of course wanted to join a club of people that make visualizations about exoplanets. And my setup was very simple. I just wanted to do some data storytelling and explain how weird or, or amazing these exoplanets really were. But to make these circles rotating around one generic star more than, well, flat circles, I want them to look like spheres by using a, a gradient. And I also wanted to have each of their colors depend on some aspect of the planet's data. Well, a radial gradient is the second option that you have for gradients. Uh, well, it's just, and it's as you expect, from a center point outward. And creating a gradient based on data is also very easy. We can use D3's data step in a similar way. But this time, we immediately append our data set when we uh, want to attach it to the devs so that D3 will create a gradient for each of our data points. And it's still very important that you give each of your gradients a unique ID uh, to reference it again when you combine them with your circles. And afterwards, you can um, use the data that's inside of it to set something like the color of your gradient. So I can say, well, some feature with a color scale should then uh, be used. 
and then I can make it lighter on the inside, a bit darker on the outside. I can move that location of the center. I can make that directional arrow a bit bigger. And now we have something that sort of mimics a 3D sphere by just using that one color that we had to start with. And if we were to look in the DevTools, we'd see that we have a radial gradient for each of our data points, and all of them would be slightly different. And finally, we select the circles and we connect them to the right, uh, right gradient. Well, instead of showing you a visualization about exoplanets, which you've seen, I think, I, think um, I thought, well, I'll show you what I think is one of the most important plots in astronomy. It's a hertzsprung russell diagram. And in this case, the circles that you see are not planets. They're actually stars. And these are some of the nearest stars that we have. And we have luminosity on the vertical scale and temperature on the horizontal. But note that actually the, the warmest stars are on the left side and the cooler stars on the right. There is a, there's a reason for that, but I won't go into that. And I heard that this could actually be one of the first scatter plots ever made, uh, which I think is kind of cool. And our sun is somewhere over there. And these stars in the upper portion, they are indeed bigger. But I'm not actually being honest, because if I would scale them correctly, they would look like this. <laughs> but then you, know, then you can't really have any useful things from the rest of the plot anymore. So that's why we scale them down. Also, of course, stars are the things that shine. They are not shined upon. So we can tweak this gradient uh, a bit and try to make them look more like the glowing orbs that they are. And what I like also about this plot is that I feel that there is uh, very little visual encoding done. I mean, the stars, they are roundish, round, and they are actually sh visible in these colors. So it's like you're plotting the things that they are. I mean, I don't know of a more perfect scatter plot than, than visualizing planets and stars. But I might be biased. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway. Besides using uh, data to set the colors of your gradient, you can use data for setting any attribute of your, your gradient, such as the directions. And after watching the second Avengers movie, I was interested to know how all of these Avengers were connected, how often had they appeared together uh, in a movie. And I thought a chord diagram would lend itself nicely for this data set. So here's the result. The thicker a chord, the more movies two Avengers have appeared in together. And in the default case, um, the chord is given one color. But in here, that doesn't really make a lot of sense because the data is symmetrical, since if Thor appeared in the movie together with Hawkeye, the reverse is true as well. So I wanted to do something else. I could make them all gray, but that felt a bit boring. Um, so instead, I wanted to have a gradient that runs from the Avenger at one side to the other. So to pull that off, <coughs> let's focus on Black Widow here. And then I would want to create um, a gradient along these directional arrows, sort of mimic the idea of it running across the court. So I guess something that looks a bit like this. Well, we start out very similar to the planets case. So in here, we start by appending a court data set to the devs so that D3 will create a gradient for each of our courts. And one thing that's also different here than in previous cases is that here it's actually better to not use that bounding box of the chord onto which you want to apply the gradient, um, but use sort of the system, the chorded system that you were using with its origin right in the center of that circle. And you can do this by setting gradient units to user space on use. And you, forget, you can forget that, it's just I want you to know that it can be done. And the reason is that we can actually find the exact pixel locations of these two colored dots um, by using the chord data set together with some sines and cosines and trigonometry. Nothing fancy, uh, but it's way easier. So after setting these directional arrows using the data, all that's left to do is supply it with two color stops, one at the start uh, at 0% that has the color of the Avenger at the source, and another one at the other end at 100% that has the color of the Avenger at the other side. And after all those additions to the code, we get this result where now each of these chords is sort of a representation of both the Avengers that it links. But you can also use gradients for something else than a smooth color change. They can be very handy for abrupt color changes as well. And many interesting analyses about uh, the baby names have been done in the last few years, such as the most trendy name and poison name and unisex name. 
but I was interested in much, something much more simple. I just wanted to know how had the most popular baby names risen and fallen from fame again. But I was actually very surprised to find out that the data set went back to 1880. But a typical screen isn't really wide enough to do justice to 135 years of volatile change. So instead, I used the focus and context technique, in which you have a, a small box below, in which you see all of the data, and you select a small window, and then uh, this top chart here will show you sort of the, um, the more detail of the small box that you selected. But to make the connection between this small window and the top chart more apparent, I wanted to color um, the, the, the bottom window only exactly exa the same as sort of the top chart, but only within the window that you selected. However, you can only stroke a line with one color. And I didn't want to have to cut these lines up into three sections, like before and then within and then after the selected window. And instead, I just used a simple gradient to recreate this effect. Because if you append two color stops at exactly the same location, the color change is very abrupt. So first, we append a gray stop and then a colored one, both at 40%, and we get this result. It seems as if we have two different things. And then we do the reverse at some other percentage, say 60. So first a colored stop and then a gray. And now it appears as if we have these three different sections. So if I take one of these uh, gradients for these lines and I, I apply it to a rectangle, it seems as if we have three rectangles, or it's only one with a gradient applied to it. And by changing these percentages, when somebody's dragging this window, and therefore some update function is called, you can actually make it appear as if the gradient is moving along with your choice. But it can also be very handy to visualize thresholds, such as above a certain value something is bad or good or it changes categories. And here is an example of the mean body mass index uh, for 50 randomly chosen countries in the last four years. And above a uh, uh, 25, according to health institutions, you're overweight. Above 30, you've become obese. And I've colored these lines with a linear gradient, all the same gradient. So to show this threshold of something changing from, from sort of neutral to bad, more, more apparent. And this line, I really just suddenly becomes uh, from gray to, to orange. And even if you change your data set, you don't have to do anything about the colors. So if you go from men to women, the linear gradient doesn't care. I mean, the threshold is still in the same location. So you don't have to think about that. And I was also actually very pleasantly surprised to find out that uh, gradients can easily be animated. And I was working on a fun project um, at Deloitte where we had access to a data set where we knew what education people had studied and then what occupation they were doing a year and a half after their graduation. And we wanted to show this flow from education to occupation. And I could do that with a Sankey diagram. So from one thing to another. But I, I love circular things, so I wanted to try something more circular. So I went back to a chord diagram, which I love, of course, because it's circular. And then I started tweaking this around, adding things. I even went into D3 source code and made some changes here and there to make it look more like a circular Sankey. Although I've seen the term bad plot uh, on the internet as well, which I think is kind of a catchy name, though. Bad plot. The bad plot. Anyway, this is the end result. So we have educations on the left and occupations on the right. But to make this flow from education to occupation more apparent, I wanted to mimic that by actually making a animated gradient from education to occupation. But not too much in your face though, <laughs> but it was there. It's like, it's going that way. And this also gave me an excuse, animating a gradient, to put Menard's famous map in my presentation. <laughs> Yay. So here I just wanted to show the troop movements so that the brown portion is moving towards Moscow and the black, they're moving away from Moscow. But again, <laughs> never too much in your face, but there. All right, so we're finally leaving the realm of SVG gradients and moving into SVG filters. And um, you might know these filters in a similar way that you know them from Photoshop or Instagram. And to be honest, we're also sort of leaving the realm of effectiveness in the visualization behind and moving more towards experimenting to have or create a bit of fun. 
While creating a filter starts out very similar to a gradient. So now we append a filter element to the depths. We still have to give it a unique ID though. And afterwards comes the magic part where a specific combination of filters creates some effect that you might never have expected. Uh, but the good thing is, is that once it works, you can just copy that code and use it in whatever visual you want to use it in. You don't have to change anything. Usually you can only change a few things anyway. So I'm not going to show you the code here, but focus on the results. So what can you do with these filters? And afterwards, uh, you select the element and you set the filter style by referencing this, uh, this ID. All right, so the first one is very subtle, but it can have a nice added effect in the right circumstances. Well, some people love radar charts and other people hate radar charts. I'm, I'm not part of that latter group. So um, a few months ago, I made a redesign of a radar chart in D3. I'm always fine with it the way it looks, but I remembered coming across um, some code for a filter to create a drop shadow or a glow around text. And I thought, well, maybe that will make this more engaging as well. So I'll show you the glow. It's really subtle. I hope you can see it on the screen. That was it. And this is really also a matter of tastes. You know, some people might like it more. Some people think it's, it's worse. I mean, I'm, I liked it, so I left it in. But what it does, it's very simple. Uh, say you apply it to a circle. Then it creates a blurred version of that circle, pastes the normal version back on top of it, and then you have the appearance of a glow. And you could do that with rectangles and um, paths and circles, but not lines though. So no glow with glow, although it's a bit better on my screen. Um, and one occasion where I, uh, I found that really sort of made it look more special was when I was playing around with uh, spirographs. And I really loved these as a kid. Um, and so now we have no glow and with a bit of glow, it just made it more <coughs> neon, made it jump off the, the page a bit. So with glow, no glow, it's, it's really subtle. Well, another filter where I found that um, it had a sort of a, a nice touch is had to do with uh, motion blur. And if things are moving faster or closer to us, they appear blurred. And with the right filter, we can recreate that effect on the screen as well. It's just these circles. The faster they move, the more blurred I make them appear to mimic this idea of fast movement. And I first came across this when I saw a, a demo for an image gallery where images were just sliding across the screen. And I thought, well, you know, in data visualization, we usually have movement, well, often show movement. So just trying to figure out if I could use that there as well. And it's very simple. It's just making the element blurred in one direction. That's it, X or Y. As an example, here we have uh, some circles moving outward, no blur, and with a bit of an exaggerated blur, it looks like this. So no blur with the blur. And I feel that the blur just makes it, makes it a bit more human, I guess, a bit more uh, fun to look. So for a, an appropriate data visualization, I thought, well, let's visualize the top running speeds of some animals in the fastest human. So when these circles are moving outward, the faster they move outward, the more blurred I make them appear. Although I've seen that there is a ghost circle sometimes, which is not on my screen, but here it is. So that, remember, forget the ghost circle. So I, when they moved out, they were blurred, but probably you didn't actually really notice it. It's like a subconscious thing. So let me pull them back in and just show you the blur that was happening. So the cheetah's moving fastest, so it gets the most blur. And then the turtle is practically not moving, so it gets no blur. And you can do this with more than just these SVG elements. Say you wanted to append visuals or images to your data set. Fine. They know the, the, the filter doesn't mind. If I move these outward, they will get blurred as well. OK, so now this is my favorite filter, the GUI effect. And I first came across this one when I saw a really nice um, loading demo um, somewhere on the, on the web. And I thought, wow, that's a good one to keep in mind. And at some point, I was working for the Deloitte Ladies Open, which is a golf tournament. And people could do a golf clinic and do a few swings, and then they could see their results on the screen. And to visualize how far the ball had gotten, I could just let the points appear on the screen like this. But that felt a bit boring. So I thought, why not mimic the golf swing and let the circles fly out from a starting point? You know, I thought this was better, but I wasn't quite feeling it yet. So then I remembered that GUI effect. And by adding that, 
suddenly it felt as if the visualization was trying to acknowledge the effort that the participant was doing, trying to get the ball as far away as possible. Now it didn't make this more true or false, but it just made it more fun to watch for these people. And I'm not even gonna explain how this filter works, I only understand about half of the steps. But besides having this fun GUI effect, it does some nice color blending as well, I think. So that's really cool. Well, I'm trying to think of some ideas for data visualizations other than the one I had. Say we have one of visualized 150 largest cities in the world. We could just let them blurb out of this center dot. <laughs> or instead, if we wanted to bring them back together on a country level, I mean, a country is one thing, so once they come together, they form one country again. And this actually also reminded me of Mike Bostock's collision detection. I mean, this is fun already. It's working, but you know, with this, it seems, oh, no. Right, there we go. So I actually find this a lot of fun too, like trying to keep that one out, still the same, but seems like your mother would not have wanted you to play with this in real life, sort of kind of ugly thingy. Anyway. So it's time for the final example, and this one has to do with those nice um, color blending techniques that you have in Photoshop, where one color overlaying another can create an entirely different color. And I first tried to do this with SVG filters, and it is possible, but then I saw a blog that showed how it could be done with just two lines of CSS, so I, uh, I skipped the filter part. But although the um, it's no longer a filter. The effects are still visible on SVG, so that's why I put it in. So my two favorite blend modes are multiply and screen. And you can create this effect by setting the mix blend mode of these circles to either one of these two. And it's also very important that you have to group these circles and isolate them. Otherwise, the background color will be taken into account when, you, uh, when the, mech, the, the blend mode is doing its thing. And you might end up with seeing absolutely nothing on your screen, having no error messages, and not fi you can't figure out what the heck you're doing wrong. I've, I've been there. I didn't know that at the start. Um, so no data visualization example right here, um, but just something that I can watch indefinitely. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, the, 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 the blending really makes it for a better result because if I turn it off, I mean, I'd say that definitely has less magic. So I hope that um, some of these examples will be, assist you someday to create an even more effective or fun visualization. Uh, I hope even more that I've inspired you to always go and experiment with the norm so that you have to make as few concessions to the computer as possible to recreate the image that you have in your mind. And above all, I hope that you'll go beyond the shapes. Well, You'll be able to find all of these examples that you've seen with way more explanation and all of the underlying code on my blog soon. And uh, finally, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>